Well, it's been an honor to uh, be your MC for this event, and it's been a lot of fun, and I get one last chance to introduce our uh, keynote speaker for the MPUC Children's Leadership Conference, and I have been richly blessed by Pastor Jose in the last few days, and God has given uh, you, Jose, such a, an ability to, as I see it, open our hearts with laughter and then just speak truth into our life. And I think what I'm going to walk away with personally is thanking God that I have been challenged. And I know that when we encounter the Word of God and when it is spoken over our life, we are challenged to think differently and live differently. And I think you have given us a word that will challenge and grow us into the leaders God is shaping us to become. So let's welcome uh, Pastor Jose. I'd like to pray for him. And Pastor Jose, let's welcome him up. And he's going to share our final charge. <laughs> hey, God, just want to thank you so much for this leader, this brother. And I want to thank you, God, for the journey you have given him and Ruthie and their family. And I just want to pray uh, your name, Jesus, over his life again this morning. Let the words that come out of his mouth, let them just be uh, constructed fully by you. And I want to thank you for knowing the heart of every person here in this room. Connect your heart to Jose's as he speaks life into the hearts of these leaders. And we just thank you, God, for his beautiful wife, his family, and continue to expand his ministry for your honor and your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. It was um, almost 30 years ago that my wife began to panic. She said, you're getting more important positions, and I don't want you to become important. I, I didn't marry an important person. I, I married a, a guy I fell in love with, and I don't want these positions to change you. Because importance has a way of going to your head. Then you start thinking you're important. And then you lose yourself. And you become another idiot <laughs> among the list of important people. I mean that with great respect. I'm talking about myself. I'm not thinking of anyone else except the person my wife wanted me to think of that day. I said, well, babe, well, how do I, how do I survive importance? She said, listen, if you're the big shot at the event, get off that stage and listen to the people. They're going to tell you about what makes them happy, and they're going to tell you about what makes them sad. They're going to tell you about what angers them, and when is the church leadership going to wake up and understand this, and you listen. Swallow your pride and listen. Well, how do I do that? Well, I've been training you to listen to me, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, any question? <laughs> My wife has a way of saying things so I can understand them. Anyway, you didn't watch Forrest Gump. That's okay. Anyway, uh, um, she said, listen to people intently. Did, have you noticed... I'm listening to someone, and someone's pulling on my sleeve over here, Pastor, but I don't stop listening until this conversation's over. Why? Because most of you are going to forget what I preached about. I mean, six sermons. Hello. Just how much can the human brain retain when I overload you with information? But among your conversations, somebody will remember this nugget, someone will remember that nugget, and among yourselves... Overall, the guy was crazy, but somehow the Lord performed a miracle, and I got these two things, these three things from the, the, all those six sermons. But what you will never forget are our conversations. Why? Because somebody trained me to listen. Just listen. That's leadership. Leadership isn't telling people what they're supposed to do and what they're not supposed to do. Somehow we fell into that foolishness. Leadership is listening. So my wife then, 25 years ago, added another component to listening. 
go out of your way to create a memory for people. As you listen, say one thing that they will never forget for the rest of their life. And that takes practice to love someone enough, especially if they just told you off, that you can create a memory for them that will change their life. It's a little seed that may not germinate for 10 years, but that seed was sown with faith, with the trust that the Holy Ghost will take it to the next level. Then somebody else will come along that they do trust, and that seed will germinate. And yet, make sure you go out of your way to create a memory. So when people catch up to me 10, 15, 20 years later, they tell me about the memory of that conversation. They have no clue what I preached about. Well, there's 7% of you that still remember what I spoke at your graduation. But it's unusual for people to remember a sermon. All I remember was great. I just don't remember what he said. But you never forget when someone took time to listen to you. So I'm exhausted, not from six sermons and two seminars. I'm exhausted because I got to the privilege of listening to over a hundred of you talk to me about your concerns and your joys and your little girl who's still out there and you're taking care of her baby and you don't know where she is. About your marriage that you're uncertain about if it's going to make it or not. About, about your marriage that didn't make it and how are you going to face the future. How? You see, brothers and sisters, if we don't listen, we're not leading your children don't just need you to lead them in singing and Bible lessons. They need you to listen to them. You need to circulate in your congregation and listen to your people. Have you noticed number two? We need to bring back the romance into our churches. We're a bunch of... Anyway. A woman came and said to my wife, because she's a counselor, I'm the widow of a living man. Hasn't touched me in over four years. I'm speaking bluntly. If there's no intimacy at the house, how do we want intimate love at church? Let's bring back the romance. Fall in love again. You know, I've, I've worked on many White House projects with three different presidents, two different parties. But everyone tells the same stories at the White House. And there are stories you'll never hear in the press. You only get them on the staff, on the crew, in the White House mess. Pass me the salt. Oh, let me tell you, I've been here since Richard Nixon. And let me tell you, that couple that stood out was Ronald and Nancy Reagan. Those two lovebirds managed to fly into this house. Everybody else, you could hear them screaming at each other, Lady Bird Johnson caught her man in the Oval with somebody else, Hillary Clinton, likewise, and you go right down the list. And I won't name other names because you'd be very disappointed at who's been unfaithful to their spouse. But Ronald and Nancy, we knew to stay away from the top floor at certain hours because there would be untoward noises coming out of that room. So <laughs> Secret Service allowed them their privacy. Those two were madly in love. And President Reagan would take Nancy by the arm as a lead because he was honored to have this incredible woman at his side. And Nancy would say, don't you mess with my Ronnie. <laughs> or, and you did not want to mess with Ronald Reagan. Nancy Reagan had tools in town. They wore suits and dark glasses. They can ruin your life if you mess with her husband. You know, a romance gave us one of the most powerful presidents in American history. Bring back the romance. Look at you looking at me hesitantly. Are you listening? No. You see, be unafraid to love. Now, if you're in the precarious situation where yours fell apart with great respect, continue to love. Continue to love. Get out there and listen. 
and create memories in people's lives. I received a text a few minutes ago from my Ruthie. You could tell she's feeling better. She says here, quote, I woke up from a terrible dream about you and others this morning. Please, Jose, take time to listen to others. Let them share their experiences and their stories. Amen. You see, I'm still under construction here. <laughs> I'm still being trained by a very wise woman that I passionately love that I'm not worthy of. Whenever we would leave a district, people would tell me, oh, Pastor, oh, and they, with tears, we're going to miss you. Who else preaches good overtime sermons? <laughs> My kids will miss you. He's funny. He's weird. I like him. But when they'd say goodbye to my wife, they'd freak out. What are we going to do without you? Because she saved hundreds of marriages. And those that she couldn't save, she's brought back broken hearts to, so, to health and stability again. I married an angel. See, all of us have someone that God sent to us. It doesn't have to be through marriage. It's somebody who helps you along the journey of leadership. God did not call you to be important. God called you to listen. Amen. And that's what we've stopped doing as a nation. That's what we've stopped doing as a church. Look at me. May I speak plainly? I asked this on opening night. Can I ask that again this morning? So with your permission. Okay. We're among leaders here. We're among commanders. We're going to talk Turkey. Please do not call it ever again political correctness when we hurt over the racism we're continually experiencing. Okay? Do not answer, my best friend is black, I don't get it. You have no idea what it is to be of color right now. Do you hear me? I'm this important guy being received everywhere, but I get jerked around out there. Let me tell you, it's not easy, but I love my country. I'm a patriot. I'm not angry at anybody. I'm just tired of wiping tears in the bathroom at, at Subway Sandwich. I was at uh, the Union recently, and I uh, was put up in the Hilton in a suite. They were making a fuss, taking care of me. That's embarrassing, by the way, because I'm still the son of peasants. I don't know what to do with the trappings of luxury. I mean, I, I, it has its place. I just don't know what to do there. I, I'm afraid to put my fingerprints on something. They might have to clean up after me. And as I'm checking into the Hilton, the gentleman in front of me, I said, hey, it's kind of cold out there, isn't it? And he just looks at me, and he goes and stands in the corner to wait until I register. Refused to address me. The young man at the counter, he says, I'm so sorry about that. He doesn't know that you're our White House guest. It's all right, I said. Welcome to my world. So don't let anyone tell you it's political correctness and the PC police. It's real. And their children are in your care. Okay. Now, people of color, quit complaining about white people. Some of these people are saying, I haven't done any of that. Why am I to blame for what others are doing? Around here, we love each other. Let's get on with it together, shall we? Amen. People of color. I don't want white people shouting amen. I want folks of color to sh <laughs> shout amen. Because I, I notice white people sitting strangely quiet as I talked on the other part of it. But folks of color, we're going to continue to suffer. Let's swallow our pride. Because for some reason, this is our lot. But you know what? We're going to rise above it because we're leaders, people of color. Somewhere, somebody said, and let me tell you one moment that changed my life. I'm talking to my colleagues of color, and there's a whole variation of color in this room. Praise God Almighty, right? 
Don't you be talking about, you see, it, it, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, uh, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, worked with presidents, worked with world leaders, was one of the most renowned, respected men, and I would now suggest in world history. But when it came time to die, he died for garbage workers in Memphis. And when they went out to march, and I remember watching this on television when they ran the tape on the evening news, men, and I saw Dr. King give instruction, we will march in an orderly fashion. We will obey all traffic regulations. We will show the dignity of our manhood. Some of us will be arrested today. Some of us will be bitten by dogs today. Some of us may even die, but our death, quote, shall be redemptive for others. In other words, because of our death, someone else will be liberated. And then they put on their signs that simply said, I am a bad. So people of color, you keep your sign on. I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm a daughter, son of the king. Amen. I look like him. And quit complaining about white people. Because we need each other. Amen. They have the money, you know. <laughs> Don't drive away the budget. Am I being transparent enough for you? Amen. It's hard. Because if you go through the stuff we go through continuously, you start getting bitter. There's a lot of silence on both sides this morning because our nation has been actually nurturing this stuff. This is not from the Lord. This is straight from hell. It is not political correctness to complain about police shooting and killing unarmed people of color. Don't complain about it. It's real. They used to practice on us, break our arms and legs. And who are they going to believe, a 20-year decorated veteran or this punk with a rap sheet? You have no idea what it's like to be roughed up by the cops. It is not anti-police to be concerned that we're being killed by them. Don't you feel terrible right now? This is not a sermon. Okay, now let me flip it on its head. I have police in my family, so don't be bad-mouthing police, okay? There are people of color wearing the uniform as well. And so when I meet with police chiefs and brief officers on community relations and how to improve our listening Always the chief says, give me just one more phrase, Reverend, that I can use for morning watch tomorrow with my crews. You see, I support the police. And I also am requesting that the police quit killing unarmed people of color. Both can happen at the same time. That's leadership. So after this Ferguson tra uh, uh, tragedy... And this kid was killed. Don't, don't blame an 18-year-old for behaving like an 18-year-old. He lay in the sun for four hours in front of his family, face down in a puddle of his own blood. That is not human, and it certainly is not humane. But when they had the Unity Summit in Ferguson, they brought me in to talk about what we can do to listen to each other. I stay away from the media. You notice you don't see me doing interviews because God didn't call me to shine. He called me to make sure Jesus shines. Amen. Follow? Amen. So I'm talking plainly, but notice there's two sides. My, wife, my, my daughter, Veronica, married a wonderful young man named Shelton Banner. He's a tree. He's six foot five. He's, one day a tree walked into the house, almost bumped his head. <laughs> Sweetheart. <laughs> Yeah, this is Shelton. He came to my office at the GC one day. Excuse me, Elder Rojas. I, uh, do you have a minute? I said, no. <laughs> but now that you're here, <laughs> I'll mess with your mind. Huh? It's, anyway, well, sir, I just, and he wears hats like me. Uh, I just wanted to, um, 
Well, as you know, I like Veronica. No, I didn't know that. <laughs> well, I do. <laughs> Veronica likes me. <laughs> Sir, I, I was just wondering if, uh, well, you know, if it's all good with you, if, if I can take Veronica out, you know, to eat, to a restaurant? You ain't gonna park nowhere afterwards? Oh, no, sir, no, I, I, I'm messing with him, just making this tree tremble. Because <laughs> my Veronica is this tall. Anyway, <laughs> I said, you come here to ask for my blessing to date my little girl? Yes, sir, uh, respectfully. Come over here, son. And I did my best to hug him. <laughs> That's a real man who asks the father's blessing to take his little girl out to eat. And my little girl was very sharp. See, she's now a registered therapist. She brought Shelton over so we can all fall in love with him at the same time. And by the time he said, sir, I'd like your blessing and ma'am to my, to my wife for your daughter's hand in marriage. So I have this wonderful African-American son-in-law who I would gladly die for, that I'm proud to call my son. Because our generation called it interracial marriage. They just call it love. See, the children you lead don't think like you do. Don't teach them to think like we do. Look what a mess we've done to ourselves. Our next generation must think with an open mind, with a pure mind. They're already there. Do not pollute them. And how do we guarantee it? How do we guarantee that? I woke up from a terrible dream about you this, and others this morning. Please, Jose, take time to listen to others. Let them share their experiences and their stories. Listen. What is hope? When you believe in something. What is faith? When you do what you believe. What is hope? When you believe in something. What is faith? When you do what you believe. Now, we began with this and I want to conclude with this verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, back to the hypocrisy chapter. Some of you were outright offended. So what? There comes a point that I wear out trying to confront opinionated people who have done enough damage and they will not shift in their thinking. We had incredible music all weekend, right? Yeah. And yet we had rock music for our praise music with the little boys. Now, we don't mind hearing it. As long as we don't see the drums, we're going to be all right. But when that generation dies, then drums will know Jesus approves of them. But for now, this generation cannot handle a drum set, but they don't mind hearing it. Some of you are offended at me again. I'm looking at you. You've crossed your arms. <laughs> public speakers. I teach public speaking at both the master's and doctoral level. And you read your audience. So when people cross their arms, your obligation as a speaker is figure out how to get them to uncross them. That means you've hurt somebody. They're naturally defensive because they've held to this position for 48 years and they're sincerely concerned that you've just brought up something that the devil did to our church. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, look at me again. I'm going to die. That's the consequence of having my generation waste so many years arguing about theology, arguing about ordination. Do you know how many women are pastors in the Seventh Day Adventist Church in North America, and they've been there for decades. This is not a new subject. This is, and yet we have the gall to argue about ordination when anointed women are already among us pastoring. This is nothing new. The devil's not introducing anything. Just closed-minded people that don't listen to each other have held up the work, and the Lord has had to tarry. 
And our consequence is that we're going to die on this side of the Jordan. And the next generation is the generation that will cross over to the promised land. You will be alive to see him come. The rest of us are going to die on this side. Because we saw giants, theological giants, ordination giants. We're not going in. I don't know what to do anymore. I've done my best. But we failed as a generation to finish this thing. So we're now looking for people of character, of conviction and consecration to God Almighty to go back to our basic fundamental values of Adventism. Jesus is coming again and he wants to save you. That is the Advent message. Three angels proclaiming to come out of her. But no, we stay there arguing theology. Okay, you should have never given me permission to open up. It's kind of overloaded your circuits now, huh? 1 Corinthians verses, chapter 13, verses 11, 12, and 13. We began with this verse. Now watch what happens when you read the last two verses afterwards. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became an adult, I put away childish things. Now remember, and I say this in a very qualified way, we are still very childish leaders at some of the higher levels of the church. Now I'm not indicting everybody. By our fruits, we know it. Shame on us that we should close our minds to the movement of the Holy Spirit and divide this precious denomination instead of finishing the work. We are childish. We have not been childlike. Please do not think liberal or conservative because you will stop leading those terms stop you in your tracks and you can't lead anymore and you will not listen to anyone if you've labeled them. For now we see through a glass darkly like kids do, but then we will see face to face. Now I know in part like a child, but then I will know even as I am known. And so now verse 13. So now there remains faith, Hope and love. These three things. But the greatest of them is. So if you have the faith, you're doing what you believe, enough to move a mountain, to get these children to become incredible people. If you don't do it with love, you're just a hypocrite. You gain nothing. If you can speak with power, my wife has always been terrified. She doesn't want me to be a hypocrite. My man is going to be a servant. She's committed to that. And whenever I forget, there's a difficult ride in the car on the way home. She'll grade me. Okay, one to ten? Yes, four and a half. Baby, I thought it went well. I'm not talking about your delivery. I'm deeply concerned with your content. Don't mess with my angel. It is time to go back. You have been on the mountain. When Moses left the mountain, because he had seen the face of God, they had to put a gunny sack over his head. What's with the bag? Well, go take a look. He shone brighter than the noonday sun. When you get back, folks are going to tell you, what happened? You're glowing. Have a bag on hand in case you need it. Because this weekend, you have seen the face of God. I was hungry. You gave me to eat. I was naked. You were concerned enough to find me some dignity and clothe me. I was in prison. You, 
you went to see me instead of saying we need stiffer sentences and throw out the throw away the key. We, I was sick and you you came to visit me. I was a foreigner and you took me in. When did we do all those things? When you went to the children's ministry summit in Portland. Of course, that's a Rojasian paraphrase. <laughs> to quote the Andrews scholar, you need to see yourself with new eyes. Look into the mirror and say, I am a son. I am a daughter of the king. I look like him. And he has called me for such a time as this. For this moment in history. To guide the promised army, not the church of tomorrow, the only church we have left. Because if we leave it to our own devices, we will destroy ourselves. You're looking at an administrator of over 20 years. I am not bitter. I am not discouraged. I'm clear on our message. But I'm not going to stand around anymore and just watch us die. So now I lead a self-supporting ministry, Movementum. I know it's a corny name. A movement with momentum. Movementum. It doesn't make sense, does it? But you know what my prayer is? Knowing now that I don't get to see him come during my lifetime because we wasted time fighting among ourselves. Now that I know that I will be laid to rest someday, I've only asked God at least, at least... Let me see the beginning of that final movement. If I get that privilege, then I will die in peace. I have no fatalistic or suicidal thoughts in my mind, but I am a realist. I'm a strategist and a tactician. I had no idea of what God called me to do. I am a vato from East Los Angeles. From a peasant family, I get pulled over by U.S. immigration because I'm told I look Mexican. Yet I'm honored that for the first time in my life, the Legoland man <laughs> has a mustache. That a distinguished puppet ministry has me singing with them. You see, I'm zero now. I am not an elected official of your denomination that you can yell at. I'm nothing now. I don't even have a district. Even a local pastor has more authority than me. I have been reduced to only a servant for the rest of my life. Jesus says, you want to be great? Be a servant. You want to be the greatest of all? Be the servant of all. So today I wear a little sign that says, Simply says, I am a man. I know what my journey is, but I hate no one. I love my country. I'm a patriot. I come from an army family. We've worn the uniform with honor. We have bled for our freedom. And we're not going to complain about our problem. We're going to make our country better. In our church, we're going to lead these children. And this thing's going to get done. Is that right, leaders? So set aside your doubts. It's time to believe. Is your hope renewed? Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Are you on the rock or on the sand? Don't you leave this place criticizing. Now, believe it or not, the other was exhorting you. Now I'm going to challenge you. 
in the name of Jesus, as a zero, as a nobody, as a man who knows my place. If you go out there and criticize this event, you are doing the work of Satan. Because the Bible is clear that he is the accuser of the brethren. And if you accuse the brethren, you are doing his work, not Jesus' work. If you are not cut out to lead children anymore, have the maturity to say, I think I've done as much as I can. I need to hand the baton to another generation who is more open-minded. We respect that, but don't go home and criticize. You go home and pray for us. It's not wrong to say, I don't know what to do in this world anymore. It's not wrong or inappropriate to say, I'm not sure what to do. But have an open mind. And if you can't, then it's all right to say, I'm going to step back, but I'll continue to pray the Lord guides the crew. Amen. Does that make sense? Am I being blunt and simple enough? Brothers and sisters, I've worked on the policy end, the legislative end, on this evangelist. You know what I really... We had 9,000 baptisms that afternoon. A bunch of guys, pastors, we had hundreds of them in the water, slipped their shoulders because we're not made to baptize four or 500 people in a row. I mean, we're in shape. Round is a shape, but most pastors don't work out, so that means arms are not in that kind of shape. And a woman came and told me off, you guys are baptizing them far too early. The back door. I go, is it you who shows them the back door? Angry people like that are what's driving away our members. And she says, you don't know what you're doing. And I said, okay, I will accept your counsel. How many of you brought to the feet of Jesus in baptism? Well, none, but I know the proper way. I said, I've seen over 63,000. Who are you to come and instruct me on how to win a soul properly? If uh, somebody, somebody once made this statement, if, if you don't play the game, don't attempt to make the rules. Please, nurture these children in the grace of God. Lead them by principle, not by rules. This is improper, this is proper. This music pleases Jesus, and this G music makes Jesus sad. No, it only makes you sad. Quit putting on Jesus your stuff. I have to admit, some of the music doesn't please me. But when I see hundreds being baptized, who am I to tell the Holy Spirit how to do his work? If another generation is reached with that, let's allow it. Doesn't have to be yours. Who's my favorite musician? Mozart. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. <laughs> but I must say today to you French speakers today, je me suis senti honoré d'être avec vous. See, my training is sociology. It's part of the three angels' messages to every kindred, nation, tongue, and people. That's sociology. <laughs> We're part of the passage. Because some people say, let's be mindful that sociologists should not determine. It should just be the Bible. That's the point. Every culture interprets the Bible their way. So some of us move among all those cultures to try to shepherd a movement of unity have you been pushed hard enough this weekend Amen. you know i didn't even get to speak the message i had for today just reviewing the stuff that overwhelmed your senses this weekend i say again i meant no harm nor did i ever mean any disrespect to sincere people who paid good money to come i not i did not intend to abuse or offend any soul seated here. At the same time, sometimes the truth hurts. Sometimes what makes us uncomfortable is the Holy Spirit saying, you need to grow to the next level. You've been stuck there for decades. Understand that this last generation has been educated by this. This is the most advanced computer that ever lived. I was there for the unveiling of Macintosh in 1984. And when Steve Jobs gave his speech in 1983, before Mac came along, he talked about, in the future, you'll be able to hold your computer in your hand. That was impossible. IBM's in your hand. <laughs> and then how do you do the basic code? Invalid code. 
Remember that? And, and, and then the printer. And, <laughs> you'll be able to hold it in your hand right here. He says, you'll be able to buy things. Buy things. He already saw iTunes in 1983 in his mind. The vision was already there. And he says, you'll be able to download your favorite song or movie. How are you going to put a record? A record. That, remember that plastic black thing? That ceramic thing for those of you who still collect them? Okay. My kids, that puppy, we went to the museum and we saw a record. It was awesome. How'd you guys have CDs that big? I, that was weird. It's totally awesome. It was like weird. You know, like you guys, like, you guys are like Jurassic Park. <laughs> and I said, I need to correct you, sweetheart. It was actually Cretaceous Park. The only Jurassic animal there is the st Stegosaurus. Everything else is Cretaceous. Poppy, just sit down. <laughs> you have the internet here. The most vile, evil, destructive things in the universe are right here. The most vile, evil gossip against the church and its leaders and its people is right here. There's the dark internet where children are bought and sold like animals. I worked on several White House projects on the trafficking of women and children. It's appalling that over 8,000 American girls are bought and sold each month in these United States of America. These are not immigrants. These are our children, and they're sold right here. The greatest righteousness is also here. So this is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it doesn't come with a handbook. It is specially made so that even a child can open it. Wait, watch. I don't have any games on there. Yeah, you have 11 games. <laughs> I've been playing all during your sermon. I'm a programmer. I write my own software for my Mac. And my daughter, my nine-year-old at the time, Papi, wait, mija. It's my program. And I couldn't solve this bug. Papi, sweetheart, please. OK, excuse me. Since you're not letting me do it nicely, I'm just going to. And she fixed it. <laughs> Nine years old. Now, in the sanctuary, we say, everybody, turn off your cell phones. That's for the adults. Because the adults have embarrassing rock music as part of their and they're the ones who fight against the music in the church. And all of a sudden, in the middle of a sermon, and then he can't turn it off. That's elder so-and-so. Kids always put their phones on buzz. At 2 in the morning, that's Angie's buzz. And it's under their pillow. And they talk all day and all night. I got a bill over 3,000 texts per child that month. 12,000 texts, and I did not have the family unlimited plan. <laughs> so as, and then I hadn't gone the online page. They, a box arrived, and we unveiled a 31-foot page. And I said, this is $1,218.16, and all of you are going to help pay for this. Very bad day in the history of the Rojas family. <laughs> and after that, I got the family unlimited texting plan. <laughs> what am I telling you? Our kids already know the world. Look at me. Our kids are already in the world. This is the most worldly generation of children, children that we've ever seen. And some of you, because if you're my generation, we were trained to panic. Don't panic. It was foreseen. Jesus prayed in John 17, Lord, I pray that they be one like you and I are one. Are we one right now as a church? 
Are we one? Are we united on theology? Are we united on music? Are we united on ordination? Are we, are we united on anything? Are we united on race? Are we united? Are we united? Think carefully. Jesus said, I pray that they may be one, united as you and I are one. Then he says, shockingly, referring to today, I don't pray you take them out of the world. I pray they be in the world, just not of the world. In the world, he repeats, but not of the world. Protect them from the evil one. So this has guaranteed that our children are in the world. Now, because of the Holy Ghost moving on you, they're in the world, but they're not of the world. So we have infiltrated United States Navy SEALs behind enemy lines. They are now there as they are filled with the latter rain of the Holy Spirit. that will come through your shepherding. Then they're in the world that does the worst damage to darkness ever seen in the history of the world for a finished work. An army of young people rising in the world because they're not of the world. And here we've been trying to keep them out of the world. This is too late. They're already there. So like we see on the street, what you going to do about it? You're just going to complain that we have worldly kids? No. Those are our children. And if they're in the world, let's make it count for Jesus. Amen. Follow? So brothers and sisters, in the world but not of the world, this is it. Quit resisting the realities of today. Open your mind and be willing to learn yet again, I say with great respect and dignity. I will now fade. And I understand why Jesus said this now. So now I'm going to say it. Because it was, a, it was a leadership statement. It is now indispensable that you increase and I decrease. I have to get out of your way. It is time. You must increase to levels you never imagined of leadership and vision. You must now fulfill your destiny. I've done about as much as I can. So I'm speaking a lot less. I'm, I'm, not, I'm only accepting one out of 100 invitations now. Because Superman does not exist. It's a cartoon figure. We should not have famous people or important people among us. Jesus should be famous. Jesus should be important. The rest of us are just a bunch of broken human beings trying to find our way. So it's important that I fade back. So I've heard three words in my heart. I heard three words in my heart. Did you catch that symbology through syntax in the delivery? Of, anyway. I, I won't discuss my grade in English. I heard three words. Right, right, right. It's time for me to publish. Enough talk. It's time to write it. And I want to compete for a New York Times bestseller. I want to see my stuff at Walmart. <laughs> Not for any pride issues because I know I'm all washed up. This old broken soul is all that's left. But I think it's time to do my evangelism at a broader spectrum. It'll still be at the ABC. You'll still get it at camp meeting. Don't worry. Uh, ABC always buys from all those other stuff too. But I, I just feel that the time for me to write has come, so I need to speak less and write more. Now, it doesn't mean I'm disappearing. You're still gonna see me all over the place. I'm like a viral situation. But those of you who are offended by me, I understand you. I am indeed what you think I am. I'm just a guy, a broken one. But just like you, I cling to the Holy Spirit for the blessing of God Almighty. Amen. So we're in this together. I want to sing one more song. Have I, been, have I leveled enough with you? You notice the transparency. I got nothing to hide. Let's be transparent one with another. And let our transparency lead to reconciliation. Let us, and, 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 okay, I think this is my third time to attempt to conclude. Ellen White said, 
we will now see, we must see a return to primitive godliness. Instead of the soteriological implications of justification and sanctification by faith, let's just say I love you and I'm going to pray for you. I know the divorce was painful, but I'm here to stand with you. We're going to pray you through this because you're a magician when it comes to leading our children. We're going to back you up. And um, be unafraid, for greater is he that is with you than anything that is in the world. If someone says to you, is it true, did you witness Elder Rojas criticizing the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in a union meeting? I didn't criticize my church. I love my church. I'm a patriot for my church as well, and I'm not thinking of individuals. I'm just grieving openly that the work didn't get finished during my lifetime. So the consequence is he tarried his coming yet again. That's all it was. Now you know what it looks like to see a former administrator grieve that we had our shot and we didn't get it done. So now it's your turn. Go get it done. Lead that army. I was on a plane flying westward with Elder Bob Falkenberg, our GC president at the time, and we had these events that we were calling Hands Across the World, and we were raising money for a global mission. Uh, we held nine events, and at each event, $1 million came in for global mission, of which my office did not qualify for a single penny. No, anyway, that's another subject. That's a budget committee item. <laughs> I used to pick on Bob, the Bob, all the time about it. I said, how come I don't qualify? You're not part of Global Mission. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Anyway, it became the theme song for youth that year in 1995 in Utrecht at the GC session. Uh, some songs take me up to a year to write. This one took 15 minutes. Sometimes the Holy Spirit just gives it to you and expects you to dish it out. Uh, I'll probably forget the words again because it's been many years since I sang it, but I'm thinking of you. I'm thinking of you as I sing this song. <clears throat> hands across the world, hands across the world. He touches hearts with his hands across the world. Hands across the world, hands across the world. We are His hands, we're His hands across the world. He touched a man that had been blind, enabled him to see. He touched the food and passed it out for everyone to eat. He touched a leper on the street, restored him back to hell. He touched a girl that had been dead, brought her back to life. Hands across the world, hands across the world. He touches hearts with his hands across the world. Hands across the world, hands across the world. We are his hands, we are his hands across the world. Standing and hold hands. He touched the hearts of people. Forgave them of their sin He called to them to take their cross And then to follow Him He touched so many people That enemies arose They took His hands They nailed them down Upon a painful cross Hands across the world Hands across the world He touches hearts with his hands across the world hands across the world hands across the world we are his hands we're his hands across the world he's called on us his people to give to him our hands to 
feed the hungry, clothe the poor, to tell them of his love. So let us all together dedicate our hands that others may know Jesus all around the world. Hands across the world, hands across the world. He touches hearts with his hands across the world. Look at me. Look at me. You notice, with great respect, I've been using what very a a actual techniques I use with children. I say, look at me. What do you do? <laughs> you look. Tell your children, look at me. Don't shh. The moment you shush a kid, two other kids, shh. I hear a rattlesnake coming from the children. Shh. There's a gas pipe. Just look at me. Try that with your kids. It's my turn. Everybody's looking this way. And the pastor's talking. Look at me. It's time to go. I know what you're going back to. A thankless position where you're not funded well enough, where folks don't see your ministry as a priority. They think other stuff is more important in the church. Keep your courage. Don't be discouraged. Jesus looked, I mean, yeah, it was Jesus, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, looking at Joshua. After that generation finally died, my generation, the one that blew it, be strong. Be of a good courage. Amen. This ministry is not yours anyway. Amen. It is the Lord's. Amen. He shall go before you. And the walls of Jericho will fall all by themselves. It's not through technique, not by might, nor by power, but by his spirit. Amen. I'd like to say to the leadership of this event, it was my great honor to be of service to you and the vision that God gave you as planners. I pray that I have been sufficiently accountable on everything except my time frames for my sermon length. I, <laughs> I'm so embarrassed by that. And uh, anyway, um, Walt Disney was building Disney World, a, a theme park larger than the city of San Francisco. And I watched him live on the wonderful world of Disney, remember, on Sundays? And he's showing the map of where Epcot Center was going to go and all these places. What you didn't know is that by then he'd been diagnosed with lung cancer and he was taking hits of oxygen every 15 minutes during the shoot. And then he came out and he says, we know where we're going, we know what our objectives are, and we're very excited about what we're going to do. See, that's you. A month later, he died. And for the next five years, they built Disney World. Exactly as he had seen it. As it was drawn, as the teams had been organized to do. And on opening day, uh, Mrs. Disney led the press on a tour the day before the whole crowds of the society would be allowed in. And they marveled at the realness of technology that to this day is relevant all these years, almost 50 years later. 
And, and a reporter walking behind Mrs. Disney says to another reporter, it's too bad that Walt Disney didn't live to see this. Without missing a beat, Mrs. Disney turned and said, he did see it. That's why it's here. So something bigger than you and I is coming. Can you see it? Vision means you can see the horizon of what God is bringing. Steve Jobs sees us downloading music and movies in 83 when that was impossible, when it couldn't even, we couldn't even conceive. Right now, we can't conceive a finished work, but God does. He's seen it. He's prophesied. So go. Be strong and of a good courage. Do not trust your own opinions. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Let's pray. Grab a hand. Grab a hand. Grab a hand. Don't worry, gentlemen. I will not tell. It's hard to tell a mountain man to grab another mountain man's hand. It's all right. Ready to pray? Amen. Father in heaven, here we are, Lord. What's left of us, beaten by the world? Some of us have given it our best shot and frankly are discouraged that nothing's worked. Some of us came here as a last hurrah to just kind of say goodbye to this thing. Others of us are young and ready and hungry and aggressive with lots of ideas. We're all here together in one place, in the presence of the Almighty. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us as you yourself prophesied. Ellen White, your servant, told us that you are pleased when we place high demands upon you. So, Lord, we insist that you fulfill your word. Shall our enemy say, see, it was never true. Fulfill your word. And here we are, send us with the great joy and honor of leading the army of youth that you promised us would rise. Make us compassionate commanders. Teach us to listen to our children, to listen to one another. Take us, Lord, because we don't know how to do this stuff. You do it. Do it through us. So now, with your blessing, with your anointing, we will leave this mountain to go back into the valley, some valleys of dry bones, other valleys of despair, other valleys of lush green and growth. All of us are going back to a different valley, but we're going back with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, empowered by the Holy Ghost to see miracles come down. So do it, Lord. We're praying with our whole heart, with sincerity, in the forgiveness of our sins. In the name of Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen. look at me. You must go and tell someone what you have seen. Please be seated.